Hi right, there folks, welcome into today's video. Palantir CEO out with some pretty big comments in relation to how their AI products going and many other various things in this interview. So looking forward to getting into this one, sharing my perspectives and opinions. And then I want to also react to this video. I know it's kind of random uh, to throw these two in, in, in the same video, but Mr. The Big Short, uh, basically his views of the market stocks, the banking sector being uninvestable. What does he mean by that? Does he mean there's just not good stocks to invest in? Does he mean he thinks these stocks are going to crash? crash soon. Uh, this is from about four hours ago. So appreciate everybody joining me as always. Thanks so much for being here, folks. Thank you for being subscribed. We're going to hit a new all-time high subscribers today. So I appreciate each and every one of you. And let's just jump straight into this. Focus in DC is one uh, to basically embarrass other people in AI to work with the U.S. government. It's like, we're doing very well here. You should also get involved. All right, so you're kicking off this inaugural summit today. Uh, you have a lot of U.S. leaders here in government um, and defense and other areas of the government. Right now today, with so much focus on AI and the potential of AI, what is Palantir's focus when it comes to its work with the U.S. government? Well, there are two things we're working on. One is Palantir related, but arguably even more importantly, um, the U.S. Uh, has every major provider of AI, which is in every other industrial revolution, you've had a just diversity of countries that have had the talent and the products. In this revolution, they're really all in America. So how do we get the U.S. government to use innovation from providers? Very few of these providers uh, work closely or closely enough with the U.S. government. Now, in part, that, that's because many of these providers have had a somewhat timid view of helping the U.S. government. The, the, the Silicon Valley motto has been, I get rich, you get nothing. Um, and they've obviously often extended that to the U.S. government. So my focus and our focus in D.C. is, one, uh, to basically embarrass other people in AI to work with the U.S. government. It's like, we're doing very well here. You should also get involved. Uh, to talk to legislators, to explain to them that uh, way too few of our dollars are being spent on AI. Uh, Palantir um, is one of... I think the first company since the 50s that has produced government products that are in high demand commercially. So how do we get more companies that have commercially available products, meaning products that are proven? All right, so f the folks, this is extremely important, okay? Extremely important. If you really want to understand how important is a company uh, like Palantir, okay, in, in AI market over time, here's the deal, okay? Look at the lineup that Alex Karp, Palantir CEO, was with. He was with Elon Musk, Sasha Nadella, the Microsoft CEO, right? The Tesla CEO, Microsoft CEO, Jensen Huang, obviously the NVIDIA CEO, Zuck, Meta CEO, Sam Altman, which is the uh, the, the CEO of OpenAI, right? Uh, Sundar Pichai, which is uh, Google McDougal CEO, Bill Gates, I don't think I need an introduction for him, right? You got this gentleman who I can never pronounce his name right, but he's the IBM CEO, okay? And IBM actually is going to be a player in AI, believe it or not. And I know old Big Blue, I've been actually doing some research on them recently. And then you got Eric Schmidt, who is uh, certainly the former CEO of Google McDougal, right? Yeah, you're not going to have all those uh, folks in one room unless they're all extremely important and vital to kind of the future of AI. And so the fact that Alex Karp is in there with those guys is big, big, okay? Big, big. In, the, right. by, in a competitive environment into the U.S. And by the way, I don't want this to be lost on folks, but there was a part he, he just mentioned where he thinks the government's not spending nearly enough on AI. So he wants to see the government obviously ramp up AI spending uh, ag aggressively, it sounds like. And how do we share knowledge? So we're, that's the part that we're doing here. We have a lot of clients, many okay. of which are sensitive, and they get to talk to each other here about what they're doing, what's worked, and what's not. All right, we'll talk more about your clients in just a bit. I do want to ask you, just a few days ago, you were in Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's AI meeting. Uh, it was a closed door meeting. The press and the public not in the room, not allowed in the room. A lot of big-name tech leaders were there. We're talking Bill Gates, Sundar Pichai, Mark Zuckerberg. What was said there? Can you give us your takeaway? We, the headlines were it was all about regulating AI, AI and government regulation. And also, I want to ask you, do you think the public should have been allowed in the room? Well, by the way, I, I can't remember if Alex Karp even addresses that. Should the public be allowed in the room? I think there should have been cameras in the room uh, for some things other than just this quick little photo app. Op. Um, I don't think they should have had to take questions or anything like that, but I think there's, that would have been great to just have some cameras in that room, right, and just hear the discussions. I think, imagine the views that would have gotten. Like, it would have seemed like a boring subject, but I'm just telling you, could you imagine the views that would have gotten with all those people in one room and the discussions that would have gone on? Oh, my gosh. 
Uh, so there, there, the overarching discussion was how do you advance artificial intelligence, meaning how do we allow especially uh, commercial uh, enterprise in America to adopt AI, develop AI, and provide it to the U.S. government and enterprise while simultaneously mitigating some of the obvious risks of AI. Namely, one, we don't know where the road is going and what happens if AI becomes generative, AI becomes so powerful that, in fact, it's a, a risk to humankind. Okay, so that, that is a real issue, and there's a lot of consensus that we have to have some way of mitigating the risk. Then there's a, there are other discussions of, on the way there, uh, how do you have artificial intelligence that has governance, guardrails, can prove that it's not discriminatory, um, and then there's the issue I'm passionate about is, uh, given the risks, we also have to model as one of the greatest risks that our adversaries, namely Russia or China, develop tools that are vastly superior to ours and change the world order. Um, I thought it was a very, very productive discussion. Um, I guess it's an unpopular view that occasionally you have to begin discussions in private, but it is my view. And mm -hmm. I, I, I don't, I, I'm sure at some point these discussions will be open and no legislation will happen. But in the end, we all have to come in there and say, this is what okay. I really believe. It's very, it's already very hard to get people to show up and kind of go naked. Uh, <laughs> but they're not going to go naked in, in public with public scrutiny. And there's a super uh, heterogeneous group of people there from union leaders to tech leaders. Among tech leaders you have kind of more corporate people than you right. have the freak show. Uh, so I, getting you're us... You're referring to yourself, yeah. but they, they, they self-deprecation understood. Yeah. I, I do want to ask you about one thing. We just showed some video of you sitting next to Elon Musk and, uh -huh. and you said, how do you get to use AI in a way that doesn't hurt humanity? That's a question that he's been wrestling with. He's been talking about the dangers of AI. So were there in-depth discussions about how to use AI responsibly, as you mentioned, so it's not discriminatory, so it doesn't actually hurt humanity? Yeah, though that's what we discussed, and there were a well, very... Do you have details? Are there some um, details you can share? Well, I mean, I can tell you what I said, which is uh, I said, look, there are, there, there are two camps. There's those that think AI is safe and those that think it's dangerous, and I'm in a third camp, which is it is dangerous, and if we don't actually work on it, our adversaries will, and we will lose all of our human rights. So that was my position. Um, and that, that, and so, and I think that is... is the you could tell Alex Karp's mindset so different than, obviously, certainly, um, probably anybody else in that room, you know, because obviously Palantir's work with the government over the years and on the battlefield and, and everything that goes on there. He just has a very different view of competition, the world, uh, if we're not the leaders in the United States of America, uh, Europe's certainly not going to lead because we, we know uh, Europe's just not very forward-thinking in regards to a lot of these products. So then it would end up being, you know, maybe countries leading that you really don't want to be leading in a space that could be seen as very dangerous over time, which is AI, right? Is what am I doing in D.C.? What am I doing every day, both as an individual and as the co-founder and leader of Palantir, is pushing America to adopt AI with governance responsibly in the commercial context. What does governance mean? Governance means you can look at the out product, output of a large language model or the inputs into algorithms and say, is this something that protects our data, protects our health records, make sure they're not being used in a discriminatory way. And on the battlefield, is there some human supervision in the chain where we make lethal decisions? And where does that data come from? Who controls it? Who can ratchet this back? Who can ratchet this up? And do we have superiority that is so great that our adversaries are afraid to attack us? The standard for the U.S. can't be parity because we're basically benevolent actors in the world despite discrimination, certainly from the comparative perspective, maybe the only benevolent actors. Uh, and the best way to make sure that we have a safe world is to make sure that our adversaries know that our weapons are far superior to theirs. That, that's ask, what I'm interested in. I want to ask you more about the meeting. Did you have a chance to speak directly with Senate Majority Leader Schumer? And do you believe, do we need an AI czar, Department of AI regulation, or something like that? We are going to have regulation. And it, there's a, and, and some forms of regulation I support. Like, what the poor form of regulation I support is um, we must, it, the U.S. as leaders, control the risk to our civilization of out-of-control rogue AI. So... I am doing this in public and in private. And I, what I can tell you is I'm telling you exactly what I tell people in private, whether it's Senator Schumer or leaders of the world or my employees or peoples of people abroad, whoever I'm meeting, I am telling you the same thing. So you, you can be rest assured that you're hearing in public what I said in private. And what I say in public and in private is 
there's a huge, there's a real risk here. But there, the upside is that America will outperform all other Western countries because of, we produce the technology, we have a legal structures that allow us to implement it, and we have the best talent, and we're the most innovative. On the military context, we, we are poised to win, but we have to make sure we actually win when we're poised to win. It's not the same thing. And that's what I'm saying in public and in private. So, Alex, we have a question for you from the New York Stock Exchange. Alex, it's Sarah Eisen. Just, I mean, it's great to hear this color and, and the philosophy behind how we think about AI and regulation. I'm curious, though, what, it, what it's going to mean for your business, because there has been a lot of enthusiasm and excitement in the market. Thank you. Oh, these are the questions I like. Okay, this is my favorite part. Found Palantir as an AI play. What does growth look like for, from governments, from commercial, from international, as, as we adopt generative AI? Um, I think for us and for everyone, what you're going to see is radical growth in the U.S., slower growth in Europe. Um, gr radical growth in the U.S., uh, so that sounds pretty insane. Uh, that's a great word choice. For, I don't, you don't usually hear that. I've been in the market 15 years. You don't usually hear CEOs say radical growth, uh, but that's what he feels like in the United States. Slow growth in Europe, okay. In the U.S., because people are going to adopt the best, uh, most robust, most useful technologies, um, and very quickly. Um, what you're going to see in the market, and then I'll get to us, is you're going to see in the market, um, you've had a, a massive interest in AI. Many of these products deliver poetry and will make, allow me to do, write an essay maybe I know nothing about. The products that are going to do well in the sense that people are going to pay for them are going to have output differential. So you're going to change the margins of a business. You're going to rebuild a supply chain. You're going to move a company from an uh, individual point-based company to a portfolio way of managing it. I love that. I love that answer, right? Because that, you know, no disrespect to obviously ChatGPT and all these other competing products and things like that. Like, you know, I, I agree with Carp. Like, okay, you can write an essay. Cool if you're a st school student or something like that, right? You're, and act like you know something you don't know. But at the end of the day, like when it comes to business, we need to change the margins of the business. We need to get cost out of the business. We need to be more profitable. We need to find more ways to make money from our current client list and our data we have, which these companies collect enormous amounts of data, especially the bigger the company, right? That's what we need as a company. And that's what and those is. companies are going to succeed uh, in the U.S. market. Um, how are we doing? It's very early days and you know you don't want to be out there being too optimistic and we're being very careful to kind of move slower than we could but we de facto cannot keep up with demand for our AIP product. We built these precursors. We cannot keep up with demand for our AIP product. Interesting comment and one of the best um, certainly things I could ever hear, right? We cannot keep up with demand of our AIP product. And you might say, well, you know, they haven't really figured out how to monetize that yet, or at least they hadn't as of the last conference call, right? Well, they certainly can over time. At the end of the day, for Palantir, it's just about like them being in, in relationships with all these different customers and, and building out, you know, potential $20 million, $50 million, $100 million deals. That's what it's all about. Um, and it's hard to do that if you don't have a relationship. So the fact that just everybody's kind of running over themselves to, to obviously uh, experiment and try out Palantir's AI P product is definitely very, very good. Technologies that are not understood yet, but the clients understand them because they are asking, how do I work with a large language model in a safe way, a governor way, where I can make them more precise and change the underlying dynamics of my business within days. Um, and what we've seen is a, in the last month a 50%, 50% increase in people using our AIP product in a month. So, um, you know, the other thing about... Can I, can I interrupt yeah. you, Alex, for one second? We have another question for you from the New York Stock Exchange. Sure. I want to get some of our anchor questions yeah. in as well. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, Alex, uh, yeah, yes, Alex is, it's David Faber. I just want to follow up on that. Um, you know, in terms of productivity and what's going to be available to the enterprise as a result of the adoption that you're talking about. One step down from threat to humanity, but what about threat to workers? Where are you in terms of how many jobs will be replaced as opposed to potentially simply aided to go work on higher end things? Um, th th this is a super important question. Um, you know, typically technology is misaligned with the worker. And so there's obviously a lot of concern about among working men and women that, you know, radical increase in, 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 in technological development will decrease both, lead to a decrease in jobs and, and put pressure on their salaries. 
I think AI incorrectly implemented. So not long ago, we had 1% of the U.S. hospital care market. Now we have 16%. Why do we have, what is going on with this radical increase? We're making doctors and nurses more effective. We're making factory workers more effective. By the way, one of the most important attributes of AI that's not been discovered yet and will be discovered is you can take manufacturing that maybe has been culturally specific to Japan or Korea, and we have one company that is a, a Japanese company producing a highly technical product in America just like they produce it in Japan with American workers. And why can they do that? Because through enhanced software, algorithms, and AI, we can control the manufacturing environment for Americans as if it was Japan. That means American work, so then you get the agility, creativity, okay. ingenuity of America with methodology which we've not been able to produce here in the largest and most important market in the world. So I, I think, and this is a message that's gonna take, you have, we actually have to show rather than tell because workers are gonna be skeptical of it, but it's actually true. All right, before we go on to the uh, Steve Eisman video here, let me wrap up thoughts around Palantir and the stock price specifically, right? So obviously we didn't talk about the, the stock price in regards to this one, okay? So I believe personally what is going on with Palantir stock price, which remember this stock started the year at like 5 to $6 range, which is just laughable, right? Uh, then obviously it went on an absolute beast run. We touched around $20, right? Uh, now we're sitting at about 14 bucks here today, right? I believe in regards to stock price, what has happened here recently is very, very healthy. You don't just go up in a straight line or something like that, right? I think this has been a really nice pullback consolidation. You're giving people time. The people that, you know, are just kind of a little more of the short-term crowd, you're giving them plenty of time to get out of the stock, to cash out. You're giving people time to buy the stock who want to buy the stock but didn't want to buy it when it was just up in a straight line, when it went from 6 bucks to 20 bucks. right? Now we're getting a several-month time span to kind of buy it at much lower ranges. So... This is one of the most healthy moves you can ever imagine for a stock, and this is usually something uh, you like to see, right? And then whenever Palantir comes out with some more exciting stuff, then you'll see the stock make another big upward move. Is that an earnings beat? Is that, you know, for sure S&P 500 inclusion? Something along those lines would be the next thing to get Palantir, obviously, back to, let's say, $20 or above. It's like, oh, S&P 500 inclusion is coming, or, wow, did you see Palantir just killed it when it comes to revenue or their guidance or amount of customers or something like that? Um, until that happens, we'll kind of just be in this let's just call it a uh, chilling range uh, of kind of like consolidation here, okay? Alrighty, let's go ahead and get into Steve Eisman one in regards to his views on the market stocks and uh, stocks being uninvestable. By the way, if you're going to watch this and uh, in, in watch me react to this, let me know in the comments section and say, I'm here for part two as well, okay? Let me know in the comments section because I'm curious, you know, I'm going to title this video, video Palantir. I don't know how many people just came for the Palantir part and are going to dip versus uh, going to stick around. So let me know in the comments section. For Berman and Steve, there's a lot we've been talking about this morning, um, just concerns and jitters after the Fed came out with a message that maybe the market's not quite prepared for. If you start thinking through that, okay, rates are going to be higher for longer. We have to figure out what that means. It's coming at a time where oil prices are up again. You've got a number of strikes taking place, wages likely to go up from here. I don't know if I'd call it a spiral, but certainly go up significantly. And Goldman Sachs yesterday coming out and saying they're looking at the biggest profits plunge since the pandemic, just in terms of what to expect from companies' earnings in the first quarter. They're going to be down sharply because margins are going to get squeezed pretty tightly. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of scary news. You can understand the red arrows it's this morning, but what do you it's think? It's not that scary. Okay, talk <laughs> and, us through and, it. And <laughs> first of all, I'm sort of amused by people's reactions to the Fed. Every single meeting, the Fed says the rates are going to be longer for higher, and everybody doesn't believe them. And now this time they finally believe them. Wait, I mean, longer for higher? How does that work? Higher for longer. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. I, because people, you have okay. to because people are cautiously optimistic or optimistically no, they cautious. They say higher for longer. Higher for longer. I mean, everybody says, we don't believe you. And finally, after the 15th time, they say higher for longer. People say, okay, that's bad. Okay, maybe maybe that's, they're just hitting reality, which is if it's not higher for longer, it's going to be because a recession is starting to set in and the economy's turned down pretty significantly. And neither of those are great options. I mean, I don't see it that way. I mean, okay. at, at this point, everybody's basically been wrong about the economy. You know, people who are negative are positive. People who are positive were negative. There's no, I mean, look, there's an economist I really respect, Ed Hyman. 
and a few months ago had one negative and said there's a recession coming. And I saw him a week or so ago, and even he admits there's no actual evidence that a recession is coming. He just thinks it's coming. So, now this hey, is a, what changed his mind? Is there a C.J. Lawrence still around? Is that no, no, he's with Evercore. Evercore. Um, I mean, he just thinks rates are going to um, eventually cause the economy to go into recession. Like but people have been, people been saying that for the last year and a half. So, look, I'm not an economist. This is a very humbling business. You could be right. Yeah, but the, the problem is, is people haven't studied history over time to understand how Fed, la- Fed lags really work, right? It takes one to three years for them to catch up to the market and really start causing major damage in the economy, right? And so if you were predicting this a year and a half ago, it was just it was just way too early. Let's just call it what it is. Like the Fed lags don't catch up as soon as the Fed raises one time. Like it doesn't work like that. It's going to take one to three years after they started rising in a substantial way to hit the economy, right? Which means more than likely it's 24 or 25. It's just a question of what year is it that the Fed lags really catch up to us and really hit us hard, right? It's one of those two years. Like, you know, unless this is just going to be a completely different situation than we've ever seen ever in history, then the Fed lags never catch up and it never happens. But more than likely, it's either 24 or 25. Probability is 24. Hey, you could be wrong the next. You could be right and wrong on the same day. You know, at this point, there's no evidence it's a recession is coming at all. Maybe it is, but yeah. so <laughs> what? Do they need more, relax. But do they need a recession to, to break the back of inflation? If it doesn't, I mean, at this point, it doesn't seem like they do. So it'll come down. I mean, look, way. like I said, I'm an economist. I'm totally data driven. You know, at this point, inflation is coming down. The economy is strong, and people are getting hysterical because the Fed says that rates are going to be higher for longer. So I, I'm not so hysterical. What, what do you think when you see the market? You see prices where they are. Do you see bargains in abundance? I mean, some, you... some are starting to develop again. You know, there's been a correction. Maybe there'll be more of a correction. You call well, what we've been through a correction at this point? A little correction. Yeah, pretty modest. <laughs> Maybe there'll be more. You know, tech has had something of a correction. You know, if there's a correction, at this point, since I don't see a recession company, I'm more inclined to say they're buying opportunities and shorting opportunities, so except in the banking sector. Okay. Let's talk buying opportunities, and then we'll get back to the banking sector. Where do you see buying opportunities? I mean, I think there's some infrastructure companies that are coming in. You know, the money that the government is going to be spending is just been a trickle this year. It's really going to come in starting next year. I mean, if you speak to the companies, they'll all say it's really not having any impact on our earnings yet, but a lot of plans are being drawn up. You know, I expect 2024 and 2025 to be massive years for infrastructure type companies. So I know you can't a, p- talk individual stocks, yeah. but infrastructure at large. Yes, I mean, aggregates, road building, factory building, automation, Eventually, someday, solar will come back, um, you know, kind of in that whole area, reshoring, greenification, et cetera. You like bonds at all? Short, long, uni, I'm not, corporate? I, I, I'm not sh- I don't short anymore. I'm not yep. short bonds. I find... Oh, no, I mean short duration. If longer. I was higher on the set, I would have been like, what do you think about Tesla? Since he's talking about infrastructure and he's talking about uh, all the spend on the government side and, and everything like that, and uh, obviously the sustainable energy goals and, and everything happened there. What do you think about Tesla, Mr. Steve Eisman? <laughs> what like, would you buy? I like relatively short duration. Five years? Nothing more than five years. Five years? Uh, co- uh, corporates or, or treasuries or munis? Or I what? like, you know, for our, some, some of our clients that have cash, we've bought some, call it five year duration corporate bonds. What quality? Like high quality. High quality. And um, what can you get there? Over five. Over five. But the, the interesting thing is that you can get over five just for buying a three month treasury. And even in our money market fund, three you can months get over from now, you, months. you might not. But get it might not. So yeah. you're 5.1 on a two year right now. Mm. You, you're taking risks there. But, you know, a combination of the two is if we're in a, in a client's account or some variation thereof at this point for those who have cash, I think is a good thing to sit and wait in that stuff. The the very thing that makes you positive about some of these infrastructure plays, the idea that a lot more government spending is going to really kick in, could that um, just hurt in terms of inflation, just the continued spending that comes through? Um, we'll see. Like I said, I'm not an economist. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. I doubt it, but I don't have any evidence at this point. What else do you like? Well, I don't like banks, that's for sure. Okay, what, what about banks? Is it the... Underlying credit issues. It's uh, not so much the credit issues. Okay, then it's It's, um, the regulatory. I actually think, if I could be somewhat blunt, from a 
not from a trading perspective. I mean, if you want to buy Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs because you think investment banking is going to come back a little bit and it's a trade, fine. I happen to think the whole banking sector is uninvestable. Why? Um, one, even though deposits are down year over year around 6%, that's mostly concentrated in the medium to small cap banks. Um, the deposits in the banking industry are still $2 trillion above trend. It's still going to come out. You know, if rates go higher, it's going to come out faster. So the idea that net interest margins are going to bottom anytime soon, I just think is wrong. Um, the other thing is that the new regulations that have come out increase the amount of capital that the banks have, which I actually think is the wrong thing that the regulators are doing, um, which is something that Jamie Dimon has said recently, but it's going to hurt the earnings and return equities of the banks. Unfortunately, I don't think any of the CEOs, including Jamie Dimon, have any credibility with respect to regulation, with good respect point. to the regulators. That's good which point. is unfortunate. Um, you know, if you go back to after Dodd-Frank, um, the first uh, vice chair of financial supervision, which is just a fancy term of saying bank regulators, would Daniel Trullo. Mm -hmm. He's on today. What's that? Oh, is he really? Yeah. So I'm going to give a big compliment for him to be on today, which well, we, maybe we'll cut, actually met him might cut a sound bite. Well, yeah. the sound bite is that he's the greatest bank regulator in the history of the United States, and no one's even a close second. Yeah, interesting. So at the end of the day, Mr. Big Short there, Steve Eisman, is pretty dang bullish. I mean, I don't think I've ever heard that man more bullish than he really sounds, to be quite honest, um, which is intriguing because it's a man that's obviously got so famous from the movie The Big Short. And, uh, you know, people just automatically usually assume he's negative and he's just not negative on this market. It's clear they pushed him um, several different ways there. And he sounds pretty dang bullish and pretty optimistic. Now, does that mean for sure everything's going to be great in 2024? No, that does not. But it is just, uh, I think, something that I think is important to kind of to factor in, and especially for a man like that that's very respected uh, for looking at the negatives first in relation to the economy, in relation to the whole system, to be quite honest. And um, so, hmm, I thought that was, that was pretty intriguing, okay? Appreciate everybody joining me as always. Thanks so much for being here, folks. Thank you for being subscribed. Also, I've got a free workshop for you guys that will be pinned comment down there, how I find 10X stocks, about a 30-minute video. You'll get a ton of value out of that one. Once again, that's pinned comment for access to that. Much love and have a great day.